Hi and welcome to that lecture of machine dynamics and in this lecture I would like to study passive vibration isolation with you. And for passive vibration isolation under harmonic excitation I would like to consider two examples here, so two applications so to speak. The first one is we consider our machine as a rigid block of mass but now under excitation of the motion of the displacement of the foundation. And the second application is a vibration absorber and this is a two degree of freedom oscillator that I would like to study with you. So let's start with the first application, the rigid machine under harmonic excitation by the foundation. You can see this example here. Again we have our rigid block of mass, we have the foundation, the connection of the rigid block of mass and the foundation is given by a spring with this stiffness C and a damper with damping constant K but now as you can see there is a displacement of that foundation. So there are some vibrations, some displacements of that foundation and so the foundation vibrates and these vibrations are transmitted to the machine. And the question is how to reduce these vibrations, these uh, displacement or this force, that force that is now exerted on the machine, on that mass M. In order to study that problem I have to write down the equation of motion and again you have seen that equation of motion, it's the equation of motion of a single degree of freedom oscillator under uh, excitation by displacement of the foundation. So you can see here on the left hand side the inertia term, the damping term, stiffness term and on the right hand side you have the excitation. The excitation comes from the spring force that is now C, the stiffness again here, um, multiplied by the displacement and these displacements should be harmonic, amplitude U0 and um, harmonic law sine omega t, capital omega, the excitation frequency. And for the damper we have to take the first order derivative of these displacements in order to get the velocity. So we get u0 times capital omega cosine omega times t. Again we introduce dimensionless parameters in order to study that equation in its standard form. So the dimensionless parameters are given here. So again the natural frequency is the ratio of c divided by m. Uh, 2d omega naught is equal to k divided by m in order to introduce the damping factor. And for the frequency ratio we write capital omega by the natural frequency. And as you know then you get the standard form and you get the particular solution as before s xp equal to v sine omega t minus epsilon and now that magnification factor v is well given more or less the same way as before. So if you compute the magnification factor you arrive at u0 because u0 was not included here in that particular solution as a common factor. So you get u0 here and you get the 1 from the stiffness part the 2d omega squared and under the square root coming from the damping part, square root and the numerator is the same as before, as in the video you saw before. It's a square root of 1 minus eta squared squared plus 2d eta squared. Now the question is what can we learn by studying, well, what would we study here? V is the magnification factor the magnification factor V refers now to a displacement, to the displacement X, particular solution, but as you know the homogeneous solution has an, uh, due to the damping has an external, uh, ex exponentially decreasing behavior. So as the particular solution refers to a displacement, capital V is the displacement and V divided by U0 which is the displacement of the, I could say, excitation, so of the displacement of the foundation. So dividing xp by u0 yields a dimensionless quantity and that would be the quantity that we can study here. So we can uh, 
by that reduce the vibrations of that mass m due to the excitation by the displacement of the foundation if we study the ratio xp or xp max divided by u naught. The maximum is clearly v because we have here a sine function and the maximum of that sine function is of course 1. So um, if you look at that ratio xp max divided by v, what you get, so v divided uh, by u naught, sorry, xp max divided by u naught, so v divided by u naught is, you get the same as in the video before. So something you're very familiar with, you saw that figure now several times. The first time for the external excitation by a force that acts directly on the machine or on that rigid block of mass. The second time you saw it when we are, were studying the excitation by a rotating imbalance if we want to adapt the stiffness of the foundation. And the third time now is here when there is passive vibration isolation under study and we are interested in the displacements or the minimization of the displacement of that rigid block of mass m and versus some kind of um, displacement or some kind of motion of the ground. And this would be the answer to that question. And the answer is the same as before. So I summarize it once again. The answer is make that connection as soft as possible in order to be able to reduce the amplitudes of the motion so that the amplitudes of that mass are the displacements of that mass are much smaller than the displacement of the ground. However, if this is not possible for some kind of static reasons or whatsoever, um, make the connection as stiff as possible, nearly rigid, in order to be able to keep the magnification of these amplitudes as small as possible. The second question I would like to deal with, so the first problem is already solved on that slide. The second problem I would like to study is a vibration absorber. A vibration absorber is used not only in the lab, for example, in order to um, reduce a disturbing um, vibrations coming from, from outside on your experimental set, setup, but also in, in very large um, buildings, for example. Buildings that are constructed in areas where, where earthquakes may happen. So earthquakes, quakes, of course, are some way of introducing a um, ground motion. And as you have seen from this example here, um, for that single degree of freedom oscillator, the only possibility would be, because you cannot have such a soft um, connection, would be to have a very stiff connection. And then you would even transfer these, um, these vibrations coming from that earthquakes that are very large, uh, that have very large amplitudes to that building, creating, a cause, of course, a lot of damage. So what you can see is, with that single degree of freedom point of view, the solution is not a good one, a solution that is uh, satisfactory for an engineer. So let's look at the two degree of freedom system here, that one. And for the moment, assume that there is no excitation here um, by the foundation, but that excitation and could be could come from the foundation, but comes here from some kind of external force, Ft, and that external force is represented by harmonic force. And the idea is um, to study that system as a kind of absorber. So um, that absorber here um, should, should act in that way, that that force is harmonic. The single degree of freedom sus subsystem that acts as an absorber should delete the force, so it should be the same quantity, the so same magnitude of force, but opposite phase, so to speak, um, should uh, absorb that force Ft such that the mass is at rest. <laughs>
Let's see whether this works. First of all, I have to derive the equations of motion that's done here. You can see that um, well, the first mass, you can draw a free body diagram, you get the acceleration force, and you have that spring force, the restoring force, which is C1, um, which is then multiplied by the relative displacement, which is x1 minus x2, in order to point um, in the same direction as um, the uh, inertia part. And for the second mass, so if you draw a free body diagram for that second mass, you have the inertia force, and you have, of course, the reaction force of that first spring C sub 1. So minus C sub 1, x1 minus x2. And you have C2, x2, the restoring force coming from the second spring here. Well, and on the right-hand side, you have F hat is the magnitude or the, the amplitude of that harmonic force, and we assume a sine harmonic characteristic, so sine capital omega t, capital omega being the excitation frequency under study here, um, for that external force f of t. I would like to study the solution for the displacement x1 and x2, and I would like to show you that there is a possibility for a certain excitation frequency uh, that that system is tuned in such a way that the displacement x2 is equal to zero so that the mass m2 is at rest even under the action of that external force. In order to do this I have to compute the solution of that system and again I'm interested in the particular solution only. You would argue that this is not correct here and of course you are right because there is no damping. This is a simplification. You could of course add dampers to that system. That makes the mathematical treatment of course more difficult because you introduce the first order derivatives, you have to consider phase shifts and so on. So uh, well, in order to, to keep the problem simple, I would like to propose some kind of practical approach here, namely saying that we know there is some kind of um, damping in that system. We know that therefore it's not necessary to study the solution of the homogeneous equations, ordinary, ordinary differential equations, and we just focus on the particular solution, but we know that the influence of the damping is so small that we can neglect its influence. So doing this, um, we set for x1 and x2 values corresponding to the right hand side. The right hand side is something that has an amplitude and a sine harmonic. And you can see due to the neglection of this first order derivative, it's sufficient to consider a sine harmonic in the setting here. You can see this would be the setting for the particular solution without considering any phase shift here. And this simplifies very much um, the solution approach. What we do then is we insert these settings for the particular solution into the ordinary differential equations. In order to do this, we have to take the second order derivative. You can easily see that then you have only sine harmonic terms in these equations that will cancel. So the time dependent behavior will completely cancel and you get algebraic equations for the two amplitudes x1 hat and x2 hat. This is the equation for the amplitudes. Now, if we are looking for the non-trivial solutions for x1 hat and x2 hat, because we would like to study vibrations, we obtain the natural frequencies of that system. And finally, we can compute um, the, from that the, the two amplitudes, x1 hat and x2 hat. So let's look at that. The solution of that linear system is given here, that linear system, by c1 minus m1 
capital omega squared, C1 plus C2 minus M2 capital omega squared, and the off-diagonal terms are just minus C1 and again minus C1. Um, the solution for x1 hat and x2 hat can be obtained by Kramer's rule. Kramer's rule states you have to take you have to take x1 hat and x2 hat, the solution of that equation by in the denominator taking the determinant of that algebraic system, so of that matrix here, and in the numerator you replace one, namely the first column for x1 hat and the second column for x2 hat, one column of that matrix by the right hand side, you compute the determinant of that changed or adapted matrix and this would be the numerator. So let's do this. If you replace the first column here by the right hand side, so by 0 f hat, and we compute the determinant of that matrix that we obtain then, then of course due to the fact that we have a 0 here in the first entry, the diagonal terms, multiplication of the diagonal terms will yield 0, and the off diagonal terms are just f hat c1 with a negative sign, but as these are the off diagonal terms, we have to take, we have to subtract the result, so leading a positive sign. So we have c1 f hat divided by the determinant of that matrix. For x2 hat, we have to replace the second column of that matrix by the right hand side, 0 f hat, and you can see that the determinant is obtained by multiplying this term, the first term, by f hat, and that's what is written down here. And the off diagonal terms are then 0. So what is the determinant of that matrix? The determinant of that matrix is just obtained by multiplying the diagonal terms minus the off diagonal terms if you do these computations and observe that the product of c1, so by itself c1 squared, is obtained from the diagonal terms and from the off diagonal terms but with opposite, opposite sign and cancel. So if you write down it term by term you obtain that equation. This is a fourth order polynomial of omega but you can see it's a hidden fourth, I would say, fourth order polynomial, you can replace omega squared by some other value and solve for the zeros of delta. And these zeros of delta are just the natural frequency. And you will find two natural frequencies for this system, which makes sense. It's a two degree of freedom system. The two degree of freedom system has two natural frequencies. For these two natural frequencies, the amplitudes, so x1 hat and x2 hat, will go to infinity. Theoretically, of course, because we did not consider any damping here in practice, we know there is some damping, small damping, but at least these amplitudes become very, very large. But we are not interested in that case. We are interested in a case where um, the amplitudes vanish. Now what we can see is that x1 hat cannot vanish because the only way that these expressions for x1 hat and x2 hat vanish is that the numerator vanishes and the numerator is just the product of c1, that stiffness, which is always present, and f hat, which is the amplitude of the external force, which is always present, so it cannot vanish. For x2 hat, things are a little bit different because you see there is that term c1, so that factor c1 minus m1 omega squared. And you see that if you choose omega, or if by chance omega is c1 divided by m1, uh, square root of c1 divided by m1, that factor is zero. And if that factor is zero, then of course these amplitudes are zero. So there is a possibility for that tuning frequency for that cap for that frequency for capital omega for the external excitation that x2 hat is equal to zero. Now of course if there's an earthquake or some other event you do not know that capital omega beforehand. So what you need is an adaptive system.
either an adaptive system that adapts the stiffness, C1, or that adapts the mass. So for example, for buildings and civil engineering, sometimes the mass is adapted by adding some water to that mass M1. So pumping some water into that mass M1, for example, or uh, reducing the level of water in that mass M1. So by somehow changing, adapting that mass M1, it would be also possible to adapt the stiffness, of course. So if you do not know the excitation frequency, which occurs quite often in practice, then there is a chance to use that tuned mass damper, that vibration absorber, by adapting either C1 or M1 here. The second question we have to ask, well, what happens, of course, if that capital omega for which we have that tuned mass damping property, so for which x2 hat is equal to zero, is the same as the resonance frequency here. So that we have an, uh, an expression zero divided by zero. Well, you can show by inserting that solution into that equation here, that uh, this is not the case. This cannot be the case. So um, the uh, tuned mass damper frequency um, omega squared equals C1 divided by M1 is always different from the two resonance frequencies that are obtained by setting capital delta here to zero. So what do we learn from that equation? We learn that these amplitudes look as follow. Let's start with positive values for x1 and x2. Positive values because um, Usually, at least, uh, delta is positive for capital omega equal to zero. You can see this because um, well, then there remains only this term and the two stiffnesses are positive quantities. Yeah? So we start with positive values here. Um, C1f hat is always positive and so is here again C1f hat if capital omega is equal to zero. So we start with positive values for x1 hat and x2 hat. They are here. What happens then is um, we are coming close to the first resonance frequency. That is our amplitudes, our values for x1 hat and x2 hat will increase. As there is no damping, there will be a phase shift. So that these amplitudes become the same magnitude, namely infinity, but negative ones. So there's a jump here, so which is just a phase shift um, of that system. We have that phase shift, so we have now two negative amplitudes here for x1 hat and x2 hat, and now we approach the second resonance frequency. However, there's now a difference for the curve for x1 hat and x2 hat. Namely, for x1 hat, we cannot change sign. So the value become, may become smaller, but we will never have a zero crossing here because there is no zero crossing possible because the numerator of x1 hat cannot be equal to zero. So again, if we are approaching the second resonance, we have to go to minus infinity here because plus infinity is not possible without the zero crossing. For x2 hat, the situation is different. You can see that that tuned mass damping or absorption frequency is located between the first and the second resonance frequency here. And you can see that we have that zero crossing, which is very important because the second mass at that frequency is at rest. It remains at rest at that frequency, but if you increase again the excitation frequency capital omega, you will hit the second resonance and the amplitudes have to go to infinity, plus infinity here. Then again, we have that phase shift, so that jump. That means that the amplitudes x2 hat become negative and the amplitudes x1 hat become positive. And now if you further increase capital omega, what you can directly see from that equation here, if you look at the denominator, then that first term with the fourth power of omega becomes the dominant term and uh, um, the 
denominator becomes larger and larger by the fourth power of capital omega, so the amplitudes approach again zero, and the same happens for x2, as here you have only in the numerator, you have only the second power, but in the denominator you have the fourth power of capital omega, so the amplitudes will again decrease until zero. So you have that zero crossing for x2 hat and for large excitation frequencies you have zeros for both amplitudes, oh, close to zero, not exact zeros, close to zero for x1 hat and x2 hat. So let me summarize the results. There are two resonance frequencies. They are given by the two roots of that expression for delta. They are called omega 1, lowercase omega 1, and lowercase omega 2, and are located here and there. And these are the values that you should, of course, avoid, or the regions that you should, of course, avoid, because the amplitudes of the displacements x1 hat and x2 hat become really, really large. Um, on the other hand, there is the chance, chance to have vibration absorption um, for the absorption of T means the German word Tilgung is the same as absorption in English uh, for the absorption frequencies um, which are given by capital omega squared is equal to C1 divided by M1 and this leads then to the fact that the second mass is at rest while the first mass vibrates and these vibrations cancel that external force that acts directly on the mass M2. And the same mechanism works if that excitation is not an external force that acts directly on the mass M2, but is a ground force or a ground excitation by a displacement of the ground that leads to a, to a ground force or to a force that is transmitted by a, the connection by a spring, uh, perhaps including a damper, on that mass. So earthquakes, for example, is one typical situation, but also experiments in the lab uh, where you would have, a, I would say, a quite environment to carry out your experiments. This is a very common um, way to uh, absorb vibrations that are coming from the surrounding and to have, I would say, a clean situation either in a lab or in civil engineering for civil engineering infrastructure. Well, this is of course the end of um, my talk and of that little chapter on um, vibration absorption and passive vibration isolation. And now in the last video of that sequence of videos on vibration isolation, I will come back to active vibration isolation and I will study with you active vibration isolation, however, under transient excitation. So thank you very much for your attention and let's study active vibration isolation under transient excitation in the next video and see you there. Goodbye.